Hello everybody, it's Mark and Nikki here from BDO. I just wanted to quickly get a check and see if you can hear us. So if you can just write down on the side there that you are hearing this all okay. We'd love to get started in a sec, but just want to make sure you can hear us before we get started. And you can hear me also. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that would also be good too. Yeah, excellent. Um, now, just to give everybody a little bit of context, this webinar will probably go for about 40 to 45 minutes, and we're going to go into a little bit of depth with uh, R&D tax incentives one-on-one -on -one for startups. But before we get started, first of all, my name is Mark. I am the Director of Startups here at BDO, and first, I just want to welcome everyone for, for making time and effort for this webinar. Um, it's really very much appreciated, uh, everybody giving a bit of time today. I'm going to throw over to Nikki in a sec to quickly introduce herself, but I guess the main reason why we were looking at doing a webinar webinar specifically for uh, R&D tax uh, incentives for startups is because it's literally one of the very first questions I get asked for most startup high growth companies is what is R&D tax and how does it work? And so luckily we have an absolute expert here in, in uh, Nicola Purser, who's one of our partners here at BDO. So Nikki, I'm going to throw over to you, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, as Mark said, I'm Nikki Purser. I'm the partner that looks after the research and development and government incentives practice here at BDO in Brisbane. Um, and I actually look after the practice nationally um, and now just more recently been over in New Zealand looking at uh, their R&D tax incentive, which they're looking to introduce from 1 April this year. So I'll try not to get too confused today and talk and stick to <laughs> Australian R&D and not confuse you with uh, multinational R&D. Um, now, just quickly, um... Nikki, like you've got a team and they're all a team of superstars. I talk us a little bit about, uh, before we get started with the R&D tax incentives themselves, talk to us about your team, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis and, and uh, what types of businesses and companies do you typically work with? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, we've got a team in Brisbane of about 10 uh, R&D consultants, managers, associate directors, etc. Um, all come from varying backgrounds. Uh, no one in my team, apart from myself, studied accounting to begin with. <laughs> yeah. um, most came from either a science or engineering background and have retrained into some financial services uh, areas. Yeah, excellent. And I guess the like one of the things that I, I get asked a lot from startups is, like, uh, am I too early for BDO or am I too early to talk to somebody about this type of thing professionally? Um, like, what's the size range between the, the, the smallest to the largest companies that you work with? Yeah, look, we work with all sorts from the, uh, the nutty inventors, as I like to call them, um, all the way through to the multinationals. Um, for R&D, you're not too small to talk to BDO. Um, it's an area that you really need to be, make sure that you're getting specialist advice um, from the beginning. And it may be that we, we have a chat with you and we don't charge for any initial discussions, but maybe that we have a chat with you and say, look, you're not quite ready to be claiming R&D yet. Come back to us in a couple of years time when you're a little bit further down the track. Um, but in terms of if you've got an R&D claim, then we're more than willing to work with you um, and, and to get that done as cost efficiently as we can. Awesome. So um, team, we want this to be pretty interactive today. So we do have some content around the R&D tax incentives that we will be going through, but we'd love to hear your questions as well. So if you have any questions specific to um, either your business or more applicably, I guess, generally across the different things we're talking about, please write them through on the uh, question bank on the side there, and we'll do our best to make sure we answer that as we go through the session today. But I guess um, without much further ado, uh, Nikki, let's let's talk um, about what we're going to be discussing today. And I guess the big thing for me is what R and D is, and and why, how does it work for startups, and best practice, and possibly worst uh, case scenarios. Um, talk to me about what you think we'll be probably covering off today. Yeah, I think that's the. Um um, the, the, the crux of it, I guess, is what is actually R&D and what companies need to do to access the program and to make the most of it um, and to not get themselves um, in trouble with either the ATO or Oz industry. Because mm -hmm. we have had some examples recently of startups or, or scaling companies actually get asked to give their money back. Um, so we don't really want to be in that situation. No, right? you don't want to be in that situation. Um, and so we want to make sure that people understand what it is they need to do to, to appropriately document their clients claims um, to get be making sure they're getting the right advice so that they're not um, if Oz industry or the ATO come knocking um, with requests for information that we don't end up in an audit situation and or worse with findings making us repay the money. Got you. 
And then uh, just because um, we like to over deliver here at BDO, we're also going to do um, a little bit to do with grants and in particular the Ignite Ideas grant um, towards the end as well, simply because uh, at the moment they are looking uh, or accepting expressions of interest, particularly for the Ignite Ideas grant as well. So we'll quickly touch on that as we go towards the end and then also questions as we go through, I'll do my best to make sure that we keep up to track with questions. But if you have anything, uh, throw it out and we'll try and answer it on this webinar for you today. But I guess, Nikki, let's get started. R&D, like, you know, I guess the, the big question is, I would say that most people aren't even confident that they understand what R&D actually is, let alone whether or not they can claim it. Um, what do you find? And I guess going to this poll, um, how do people feel about R&D tax and their, their confidence or their capacity to know exactly what they can and can't claim for? If you guys can fill the poll in, that'd be great. But what do you find, Nikki, when it comes to people even just knowing what they can do at the start? I think um, most people have heard of the program. Um, but it is a um, it is a complex area of tax law, and so um, even if they've heard of it, even if they've worked in it like me for 20 years, doesn't mean that they necessarily know everything there is to know. Particularly as um, over time, Oz Industry and the ATO may t change their positions on certain areas, so keeping up to date with all of that um, can be quite tricky. Um, so I guess general knowledge out there in the community um, is low level, I would say. I think that we have like three different types of um, people who have come onto this webinar. The first is startup founders themselves who are looking at like how this applies directly to them. Uh, second is like you know key advisors and people who um, are in professional services who are interested in helping startups in this field. And then lastly is, is ecosystem people um, or people who are, are around startups and want to know who they can point to uh, for support or direction. Um, I guess in the first instance, where do people go to start with, Nikki, if they have questions around this? Yeah, well, most people will start with their local accountant, um, but it's it's not always going to get them to where they want to be. Yep. Um, the Going to a recognised R&D advisor um, is probably your best point of call. Um, if you don't know who, who recognised R&D advisors, well, I'm one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true, that's true. So you can definitely come to us. Um, but what, what you need to make sure, and we'll talk about this probably a little bit more, is that you need to make sure your um, advisor is a registered tax agent. Um, there's a list of those on the Tax Practitioners Board website, but um, you can't be providing advice in regard to the R&D tax incentive if you're not a registered tax agent. Right. Um, so any of your major accounting firms should be able to help you out. Excellent. Now, Nikki, I think, I think we have talked around the topic of the incentives. Um, let's get into the, the weeds a little bit. Talk us through what is R&D tax incentives? What are they designed to do? Where do we start? Talk okay. us through. So the R&D tax incentive is government's program to try and support um, companies to undertake R&D activities that they may not otherwise undertake due to uncertain economic return. So what do I mean by that? Um, just say I'm a, I'm a company and I make um, chocolate bars and I make plain chocolate bars and I make a lot of money out of making plain chocolate bars and everybody loves my chocolate bars. <laughs> and one day my product development manager comes to me and says, I want to put nuts in those chocolate bars. No one in the world has ever put nuts in chocolate bars before. Um, in this utopian world, no one's allergic to nuts. This is a massive um, opportunity for my company, but it's risky. Mm -hmm. It's technically, I know the market's going to like it, but I don't quite know how I'm going to get the nuts in to my chocolate bars. Um, and it's also going to disrupt my production. So I'm a bit nervous of doing this. Um, so then I realised that the government is going to help and give me some money to do this. And suddenly that de-risks uh, my R&D project um, and I might go ahead and actually do that um, and create uh, more wealth for Australia. So that's the intention of government of giving this government support to R&D. Government around the world, governments, sorry, I should say, around the world recognise that companies underinvest in R&D. Um, and they subsidise R&D through two main means. One is to provide direct funding through grants, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and the other is through the tax system. Um, Australia was one of the first countries to adopt an R&D tax incentive um, back uh, in 1985. So it has been around for a long time in Australia. Um, the tax system is seen as a better way to um, provide um, subsidies to companies rather than grants because it takes away the bias. Just say there was another company down the road, um, competitor B, who and they're making also making plain chocolate and they decide they want to put raisins in their chocolate. 
Um, and these two projects go up to get government funding and the person making the assessment decides that they prefer raisins to nuts. They get the money and I don't get the money mm -hmm. to, to undertake my R&D. So the idea with the tax system is that it's an even playing field. If, every, if you um, meet the criteria as set down in the tax law, then you're entitled to claim that amount. It's not competitive merit-based program. Awesome. Um, talk to me about the benefits. So in regards to obviously the, the, the way that this works is that it's not merit-based or competitive. What does a startup or an early stage company doing R&D tax, what are they entitled to? Yeah, so the, the system in Australia is two-tiered. Um, so if you are a company with under 20 million turnover, so that would be the majority of startups. In fact, a definition of a, if they're over 20 million, they're probably not we'll a startup. Start <laughs> <laughs> um, but under 20 million, it's a 43.5% refundable tax offset. So what that basically means is that for every dollar you spend on R&D, you can get up to 43.5 cents back. Um, and it's important to note that part of that, the way the tax system works is um, normally expenses incurred on, on business needs would be deductible. Um, and they would be deductible at your corporate tax rate, which for most small businesses um, is around the 27.5%. Um, so that the, under the, the way the R&D tax system works is those expenses no longer deductible, um, but you get a tax offset of 43.5 cents in the dollar. So basically, um, if you were tax payable, your net benefit is the difference between the 43.5% and the 27.5% uh, corporate tax rate. So it gives you a net benefit of 16%. But the government sort of realises that you don't have any cash, you're in tax losses when you're starting up. So they allow you to cash out your tax losses and get that 27.5% cash back in hand um, each year. So you get up to 43.5 cents in the dollar. The only downside is that you lose those carry forward losses. So once you start making money, you're not going to have those carry forward losses that you would otherwise have, but nobody seems to care because they want the cash now to fund their R&D projects. Got you. Um, talk to me quickly in regards to eligibility criteria and in particular, like what do you need to be to be eligible for an expense to come under R&D? Um, Probably the key thing, and particularly for the startups, is that you have to be a, um, an incorporated company. You have to be a company. Um, you can be a branch of a foreign corporation, but in the startup world, we're mainly looking at companies. So you can't be operating through a yeah. trust. You can't be a sole trader. You have to be a company. Um, obviously, you need to be undertaking R&D, um, or you can contract that out and have the R&D done on your behalf. But we need to make sure that it's actually done for you and it's not uh, your contractor's R&D. Importantly, and we'll probably go into this a little bit more, you actually need to be doing eligible R&D activities as they're defined in the tax law. So just because you've got the world's most unique idea, and we'll go into this, um, doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to be entitled to the um, R&D um, tax offset. Um, you need to meet the definition of R&D activities. And you need to be incurring at least 20,000 on R&D activities each year. And to be honest, if you were incurring less than that, the cost benefit of accessing the program probably wouldn't be there. Okay. There is an exception to that 20,000. If you engage what they call a registered service provider, a research service provider, I should say, then there's um, an exception to that 20,000. But again, you're probably not going to at below that level. Got you. From an eligibility criteria point of view, where do most people go wrong? If they're not eligible, what tends to be the reason why? Um, normally operating through a trust. Um, right. Or um, that's, that comes up a lot because that in themselves, they don't necessarily see that they're operating any different to a company yeah. and they may have a company in their corporate structure, um, corporate trust, they need to have a corporate trustee, obviously. Um, so there can be um, a, a thought that, oh, yes, I'm, I do have a company, I'm eligible. Um, but no, that you have to actually be doing the R&D activity through that company Got you. or on behalf of that company. Yeah, um, and this is probably one of the things that I found most confusing and a lot of startups um, ask me, then I ask you, Nikki, but I guess like what is the core R&D activities? Like what are the things that are considered under this? Yeah, so I think um, the government doesn't help itself in this because it actually often says that um, that the R&D tax incentive program is its flagship program to support innovation in Australia. There is no concept of innovation in the R&D tax law. So you've got to get that concept out of your head. Mm -hmm. um, what we need to show is that a company is undertaking a core R&D activity 
And the core activities are defined as experimental activities whose outcome couldn't be known in advance based on the current information, knowledge or experience that is accessible to a person who has got competence in a particular field. We also need to show that the activities are done applying a systematic progression of work based on principles of established science. And when we're talking established science, we're talking the physical and computer sciences. We're not talking humanities or arts. And then we need to show, and this is the, the part that um, Oz industry get um, have a lot of focus on, um, is that we need to show that you undertake your activities um, using a scientific method so that you show your hypothesis, your experiment, observation, evaluation, leading to logical conclusion. And the last point is also important. We need to show that those activities are being conducted for the purpose of generating new knowledge, whether that new knowledge is in the form of new or improved. So it's also improvements to products, processes, services, devices. Once you've got a core activity, then you're eligible to claim. Um, you can also claim costs associated with what we call supporting activities. So they're the things that may not actually be experimental in themselves, but are needed for you to enable to complete your project. So that might be things like some background research or um, manufacturing a prototype that doesn't actually involve experimentation itself, but you need to do that to enable you to test your, um, your core activity. Got you. Now we have a question for the audience and thank you for everyone who is putting questions through. I really appreciate that. Um, it means that we can get a little bit of a feel as to where we are going and what, what are the parts that matter with the things we're talking about. Question for you, Nikki, is what about full-time employees? Is there a requirement in regards to that when it comes to... Not for the R&D tax incentive. Okay. In fact, you can have no employees. It could all be contracted out, okay. um, provided it's done on behalf of the company. Got you. So if you have a full-time employee that's been brought in to, to do the core activities or so forth, would they be counted as part of the cost? Yeah, for this and I'll too? talk a little bit about costs. Yeah. Um, the, um, so just in terms of what expenditure um, you can claim. Um, so the main thing is normally people's time. Um, so the biggest issue that we need to show is how much time did those people spend on that activity? Okay. Um, so, and what the tax office would really like you to do is to keep timesheets. Um, now, you. in the absence of timesheets, um, it's not it's not actually a legal requirement to keep timesheets. In fact, there's case law to say that your ordinary business record should suffice. Um, but if you don't have timesheets, the tax office, if they come and knock on your door, will want to see other ev other evidence of the percentage of time that you've spent on those R&D activities. Um, so if you're not keeping timesheets, then diary entries and those sorts of things are necessary. Other areas is contracts. So as I said before, you contract out any of your R&D, you can claim that provided that R&D is being done for you. Mm -hmm. um, other direct costs. Um, so to the extent that you do travel or buy some consumables that are needed in your process or um, spend money on, on things to access your R&D, um, those direct costs um, uh, are likely to be eligible as well. But you can't claim the cost of tangible depreciating assets. So if it's normally an asset for tax purposes, then you can't claim the outright cost of that. You can only claim the depreciation whilst it's used in R&D activities. And I've just put on the screen there, just for example, computer equipment, those things. But an interesting one there is normally for tax purposes, if you've got software development, you um, need to capitalise that and depreciate over two and a half years. Well, because the R&D rules work slightly differently, we only have to take depreciation, depreciation on tangible assets. Software development is considered an intangible asset, mm -hmm. and therefore we can claim it outright in the year those costs are incurred. Right. And I know there's a little bit of a grey area when it comes to software specifically. I know there's been a lot of questions around that. What's the, the best way to explain what are things that we would consider available for the R&D tax incentive versus things that may not be? Yeah, look, and um, it's been an area that's um, been quite uh, problematic over the years. Um, and in fact, when the tax incentive was overhauled in 2011, um, the, the original draft uh, legislation basically excluded all software because right. they, um, they said it's too hard to decide where, whether it's R&D or not. There was a bit of um, people all up in arms around that because obviously it's um, 
it's the future. It's 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 a key ele- um, element of Australia's um, productivity and, and wealth growth is through the software industry. Um, and so what they then did is said, okay, well, let's let's limit software development to uh, sorry the cost of we're concerned about the cost of it as well. So let's just um, exclude any software development that's done for internal business administration. And what we talk about with internal business administration is they're the functions that any business would have. So if you develop software to run your payroll, to do your HR, to do those, um, your warehousing, your inventory management, then then that's we're going to exclude that as being eligible R&D. But if you're developing software that improves delivery of your services to customers or um, it forms part of the products that are delivered to customers in themselves, um, then that can be eligible. What we need to show with software um, and I'm using Oz Industries language here because I don't necessarily agree with them, is that it's not routine software development. <laughs> yep. So what, what Oz Industry say is that routine software development is superficially similar to R&D. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So um, one of the things, um, and I'm just going to skip a little bit ahead on these slides because I'll just pull up. Um, some guidance that came out from Oz Industry a couple of weeks ago. And Oz Industries referred back to a thing called the Frascati Manual, which is what our legislation is actually based on. The Frascati Manual is a um, is last updated in 2015, and it's an OECD publication um, used to help governments measure statistics in R&D. But it basically gives some definitions of R&D. Um, and that um, software guidance that Oz Industry put out really focused on three areas. Um, basically, that people need to maintain records um, and contemporaneous documentation of the activities they're undertaking um, to demonstrate that it's not routine software development, to demonstrate um, that they are actually solving tech- technical issues um, that couldn't be solved without going through that systematic progression of work um, that. Uh, involves um, some level of experimentation. Um, And they basically said that you can use, um, in this day and age, you don't have to have formal records, screenshots, um, instant messaging histories, um, task tracking, those sorts of things can evidence your R&D activity. They're also wanting to crack down on what they call whole of project claims. So that's where at the core of somebody's um, project, they have some software development, which is eligible R&D. Um, but because they've got, they then try and claim all the costs associated with getting their product to market, um, and not necessarily all of that is considered by Oz Industry uh, to be either a core or supporting activity. Um, so it's really making that delineation between your R and D activities and what they will tie in, um, call business as usual. Um, yeah, and, and the last point there, as I've, I've mentioned, is just um, being careful about um, what is and what isn't R&D. And it's, it's, I'm being a bit vague, but it is really hard unless you're talking specific to somebody's activities as to, to what would fall in. Um, the easiest way to talk about it is to go back to the competent engineer test. If you've got developers who know what they're, who are pretty switched on and know what they're doing, and they have going to bed scratching their head at night going, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to solve this issue, then you're likely to have R&D. If they go, oh yeah, just need to fix some code here and, and off we go, then you're probably not got R&D. Now I've completely distracted by going to, to the, all the software development stuff at the, at the back end of the slides here. That's all right. I apologise, but I think that's important because I know that for a lot of the early stage high growth companies I deal with that do have uh, questions around software specifically, that was one of their big key concerns was just the gray area is a little bit tricky. And so um, appreciate you going into that with a bit of depth in regards to, the R&D activities or the eligible expenditure here. Um, like, talk us through it. Just like, let's finish that part off as well. Yeah, look, I'm just going to go back <laughs> to activities because I went through the legal definition, um, but I've just put up there on the screen a sort of different way of looking at it that might be sort of more helpful to you. So, you know, to, the questions to ask yourselves, are you developing a new or improved product, process, service or device? Does that involve solving a technical problem that doesn't have a readily available solution based on the experience of somebody with um, competence in that field? Um, if, if not, is the information or knowledge to solve the technical concerns unavailable on acceptable commercial terms? And if not, will you need to test or trial 
that um, something to be able to determine the outcome. If you can answer those questions, then you've probably got core R&D activity. And as I mentioned before, once you've got core R&D activity, you can claim costs associated with doing that activity, but you can also claim costs of the directly related or supporting activities, such as feasibility, quality control, literature searches, etc. Just in, so that's really the activities. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna flick over another slide. And while we're flicking that over, I think one of the things that I really like about that slide in particular was just like those list of questions are easy to go through as a founder or like in preparation for talking to someone like you. Um, sometimes it's really hard to know where to start. So going through those questions, um, that's super helpful. I think yep. that that's something that I'm going to go and put on my wall. <laughs> Excellent. In regards to um, expenditure, talk us through that, Nikki. Yeah, so we've, we've Talk through most of that. The last point there is just something I, um, is probably one of the more problematic areas in that um, the ATO allows us to claim overheads. Um, so they're costs that might not be able to be directly attributable to R&D, um, but are incurred as part of your normal business operations that have some nexus to the R&D activities. And what the ATO traditionally allowed was an overhead apportionment methodology um, looking at the R&D salary over the total salary of the business and applying that proportion down your P&L to all those costs that you might not directly attribute. So things like rent, electricity, stationery, um, all those overheads that you incur. Um, and what the ATO has more recently said is, well, using salary over total salary may not be the best apportionment methodology. Um, you may need to look at your individual circumstances. And so for things like rent, perhaps floor space is a better way to do that. Um, for mobile phones, it might be per head. Um, so look at, look at the different um, allocation keys and look at um, what would be most appropriate for um, your business and your um, circumstances. And it's an area that they focus on a lot if you do get an, Austin, sorry, an ATO review. Got you. Now, it's always really easy to kind of visualize some of this stuff a little better when you can think, I guess, about best practice and some examples, both in regards to tools and that we can have in our toolkit or examples and case studies and so forth. Talk us through uh, what are the things that are important when it comes to things like documenting this or having a valid hypothesis, and then more broadly, talk us through some cases that you've seen recently that might be helpful to, for us to understand. I'm going to harp on about documentation. Um, <laughs> yep. it, pretty much um, every case that's got to the courts on R&D over the last few years has failed on documentation. Um, and what we're seeing, particularly from Oz Industry, and I should go back one step and just explain that the, the program is jointly administered between Oz Industry and the ATO. So Oz Industry look after the eligibility of your activities and the administration of the program, but the benefit is a tax benefit. And so the ATO get involved wanting to know how much you've claimed on those activities. So they both run their own compliance programs. Um, but what we've seen, particularly from Oz Industry, is that they want to see each element of that core R&D definition satisfied through their documentation. So, as I mentioned before, you need to show that the purpose of your activities was to create new knowledge in the form of new or improved products, processes, materials, services, devices. So, looking there, look at the evidence that you can show. So what literature searches did you do? Um, correspondence with, with people, just keeping all those emails, um, just evidencing the purpose of undertaking your activities. And then looking at you know, your actual hypothesis. So coming up with um, the systematic or scientific process that you're looking to undertake. So um, trial, trial report designs, scoping documents. Um, again, emails are good. Um, and then what is the actual experimental work that you did? So photos, videos, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a formal report, um, anything that just evidences what you were doing. Um, and then what was the outcome? So what, what analysis did you do of that experiment that you undertook? Um, so just keeping, keeping all of that um, um, documentation is, is really important and will hold you in really good stead in getting through any Oz industry review. Got you. Um, now talk to us quickly about what a valid hypothesis is because I know that there's there's been a little bit of confusion with some of the startup founders I've spoken to as to 
A, whether they needed a hypothesis, and two, what that hypothesis might look like, and then three, what does valid in, inter in inverted commas mean? Um, talk us through. It's really interesting. When the tax incentive um, first revamped and we got the, the legislation written as we currently have it in 2011, Oz industry kind of um, gave education sessions and said, look, don't worry about the fact that the law um, includes this word called hypothesis. We know that in business, no one talks in that language outside of the, you know, biotech. Um, and so, um, you know, we just want to know what is the aim of, of what you're looking to do. That's shifted over time where Oz industry have become more and more pedantic about the actual wording of the legislation. Um, and they now require that when we register our activities with Oz industry, we need to sh we need to set out um, uh, in as much detail as possible the actual hypotheses that we are looking to test. Um, and so, what they've described oops, I've gone one sheet too far forward. Sorry, what they've described as a um, valid hypothesis, um, and I'm using Oz industry language there, is it's a reflects a particular technical scientific idea expressed as a relationship between variables which can be proven or disproven. And that, 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 you know, the idea that is being investigated through the systematic progression of work, and it's the hypothesis that will generally direct the design and conduct of the experiment. So I've set out just a couple of examples. And I've used company C and D, not to, um, not to confuse with A and B <laughs> who were my chocolate manufacturers. <laughs> so, um, Company C is a food manufacturer looking to extend its market reach by developing a range of products with increased shelf life to improve its access to export markets. In 2018 year, its R&D activities tested the hypothesis that a new formulation with X ingredient would result in improved organolactic properties of its cakes while attaining a shelf life of Y years. So one of the things that we're trying to demonstrate there is that we're really showing um, the quantitative you know, the extent that you can actually put some numbers or some uh, um, benchmarks in around your hypothesis, um, so you're, you're, you're testing um, particular ideas, um, then that's important. So we've gone on to say that this involved experimenting with preliminary formulations and production methodologies, as well as kitchen scale testing the formulations against the design criteria. And then it finally tested trial batches to determine whether the performance criteria were met. So in our view, that would qualify as a core R&D activity. Different industry, company D is a mechanical engineering firm, wishes to extend its range of services to the advanced manufacturing industry. 2018, its R&D activities tested the hypothesis that it could improve the energy efficiency of X manufacturing process by implementing a novel design of a Y machine capable of operating with a 20% speed increase. Company D also hypothesized that this system could have an operating life for at least said years under standard operating loads. This involved derivation of design parameters from first principles of physics and mathematics, again, focusing on the uh, principles of established science, followed by experimentation with prototype machines to measure performance against the set design and performance parameters, etc. Um, so really trying to narrow down to what is actually the scientific concept that you were trying to, to test through your R&D activities. Got you. Now on the flip side, like if we were looking at both of these examples and they weren't done super well, what are some of the things that in a um, in a not best practice way might reduce the capacity for one of these companies to be able to to either claim R&D or that it would mean that we wouldn't be able to actually assist them. What, what would that look like if we change those examples slightly? Yeah, so in, in company C, um, they might write, my hypothesis is to make better cakes. <laughs> yeah. um, and you laugh, but we do see we do see a lot of this. Oh, really? Um, so, what is it exactly that you are going to test to make that cake better? That's what Oz Industry want to see, um, okay. not not what your ultimate project objective is. What is it the actual experiments that you're going to be undertaking? Um, so that that's um, one of um, Oz Industry's key gripes um, that they see regularly. Awesome. And it's more likely to flag you for review. So when you register for the program, you fill out an application form with Oz Industry, and you set out in that what your technical objectives are, what the new knowledge you're seeking to gain is, what efforts you did to show that that knowledge wasn't already available, and what were your core and supporting R&D activities in that particular financial year. Once you register with Oz Industry, Oz Industry, once you put that form into Oz Industry, provided you've filled out those boxes. They will register you for that pro for the program. They are not 
even if it takes six weeks to get a letter from them saying you are registered for the program, they have not made an assessment of your eligibility. It is self-assessment. So it's really important um, that, to note that because a lot of people say to us, oh, you know, I put my claim in um, and, I, and I was successful. Well, unless you've been through an audit, you're not successful. You're just self-assessment. It's the same as lodging your tax return each year. Um, and this, we find this a little bit in the startup community too, is they'll say, um, I'm doing something very similar to that business and they were successful at getting R&D. They may have got the cash back from um, the ATO, but nobody may have ordered that. So they may not have actually been eligible for it. Um, so the biggest thing to do is to, if you're confident that you've got eligible R&D, is to make sure that you present it in those forms to Oz Industry in the best light that you avoid getting compliance activity because compliance activity is costly. Yep, got you. Um, in regards to um, other tips and tricks as we're kind of, um, I guess, veering towards talking about moving away from being reactive around R&D and being proactive around R&D. So moving away from simply going, oh, I've done activity this year, I wonder if I can claim it. Um, going and seeing someone like you and your team and saying, "What? this is all? This is what I've done, like Nikki, can you help me reverse engineer this being a thing? Like proactively looking ahead to it and saying, okay, well the next financial year, like if I know that I'm gonna be able to get some incentives for this and I can possibly be able to use that to be able to design a new core competency for my business or a new product line. How do you see the like, businesses and startups doing that well moving forward? Yeah, it is a tricky one in R&D because the very nature of R&D is it's not necessarily, you don't necessarily know what you're going to do. You don't necessarily know that you're going to have a problem that you need to solve. Um, but the, the biggest thing I just going back to, I guess, is documentation. Um, so keeping um, records as of the activities that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you think it's R&D or not. Um, keeping um, time records of what you spend um, on a contemporaneous basis. We find that people tend to be highly conservative and underestimate the amount of time they've spent on activities when they're doing it after the end of the year. If they do it contemporaneously, you will get a lot better benefit because um, you are you are much likely to be more accurate and, and less conservative with your time recording. Um, the I have had, um, and I will name them, um, did work with Uncle Toby's um, and they were brilliant in that when their R&D centre came up with a new cereal variety or a new um, oats variety, um, they wouldn't allow their pro project to spend any money on their project. They wouldn't be allocated a code in SAP until they'd written their project description as to what they were going to be doing and how they were going to test it. Right. Um, that's, that's, that's awesome, but it's not, um, necess it's not easy for everybody to be able to do that. Um, but I guess, I guess the, the extent that you can track things as you go, um, and even if it's just monthly meetings or if you're, you know, operating by yourself in your company and you just write yourself emails or um, recording, you know, I spent 10 hours last month investigating X and I run, ran some tests, then that's going to put you in a lot better stead to us coming in and not necessarily straight after year end, but maybe 10 months after year, year end trying to recreate what you did. Gotcha. Um, and this is important on a compliance basis as well, because Oz Industry or the ATO may not review you immediately after you put that claim in. It may be some years down the track, and you may have your CTO or whoever may have may have moved on, and then you're trying to recreate what they did without um, them being there. Um, can be really tricky. Yeah, got you. Um, in regards to, we do have a couple of questions we'll get to in a sec, um, and um, definitely we will have um, a copy of this uh, recorded webinar, uh, which we'll send out to everybody who has been uh, part of this session. So uh, please don't stress, there will definitely be a recording that you'll all be able to have access to um, once we're, we're finished this up. But I guess, um, like rounding out the R&D in particular, tips and tricks, and in particular, like you know, whether that is best practice or whether or vice versa, like things that you've seen, you like, please don't do that like please startups and founders and people advising like what, what do you see the biggest tip I can give is get proper advice um, there when the R&D um, incentive changed in 2011 and allowed a lot more cash out um, we did see a lot of rogue advisors pop up um, and people got some very bad advice and we you know seen people lose their houses over this um, you know from, from claiming things that they weren't entitled to claim even if they had some really good R&D 
Um, so that's the, the number one thing. The second thing is be careful, as you, as I said, how you describe your activity. Um, and again, get the advice on that. Um, Oz Industry use things like word check software. They also look at um, the ratios of um, how much you're claiming to um, turn over for that particular industry. Um, they, there's a whole stack of things they look at in terms of um, determining whether you should get a compliance review. Um, so, um, and a, a good advisor will have some idea of those um, those things. Um, on the, the cost side, can't emphasise keeping timesheets enough. I know it's painful. I find it painful enough as an accountant to have to do that, and I've done it my whole career. Um, but weirdly, the ATO walks in and gives, um, does a review of your claim. If you do not have timesheets, they will put you through so much more hell than if you have timesheets. It's just the way they're operating at the moment. Excellent. And I guess if you're then proactively planning for this, then realistically, if, you, if you're if you planning to then add a, just a layer of like compliance over this to make sure that you can justify anything that you want to claim, that gives you so much more options if anyone ever does come to actually ask for some um, evidence, I yeah. guess. And I think people have to mi um, keep in mind that the government's investing money in your business. As a taxpayer, I would expect that there may be, there, should, there would be some compliance required to Good enable budget. this to happen. Awesome. Now we're going to quickly just touch on grants as well, because Nikki, your team also looks after uh, most of the federal and state and local grants um, that um, we look at um, for, I guess, applicable clients to go through. Uh, and in particular, the Ignite's Idea grants, um, obviously being open at the moment. Give us just a little bit of insight in regards to grants and some tips around that, and in particular, how your team um, help some of the clients here at BDO to be able to maximise their opportunities when it comes to grants? Yeah, um, grants is a tricky area because um, there's all federal, state, local grants open all the time, opening, closing, um, different government departments, etc. We're very lucky in Queensland, um, and I note that most of the people participating in today's session are from Queensland, um, to have this um, advanced Queensland um, um, program, which is made up of multiple grants and opportunities for business. Um, the biggest things with grants is to remember, a little bit like your R&D, you're asking for investment for the government. So you really need to make yourself investment ready. So, um, and grants tend to open and close very quickly. So you need to make sure that you're keeping your business plans up to date, your project plans up to date, that you have revenue models, that you have budgets, um, that you have pitch decks. If you've got all that in place, when these grants open up, you'll be in a lot better position to try and access the funding than if you're trying to put that all together in a very short space of time. So as an example, as, as Mark said, Ignite Ideas, um, round five of Ignite Ideas opened uh, about a week ago. Um, and it's, it's a program that's been extremely popular um, in that what it's looking to, to achieve is for people who've got products or services that are at a sort of minimal viable product stage, and they're just looking for that little bit of impetus from the government to um, get them out to the market. So it's either market testing or, or field testing um, to just get them to commercialization um, stage, um, then it provides grants of up to 200,000 um, to companies to um, get through that stage. Now that program, the expressions of interest, as I said, open last week and they close Monday 25th of March at 10 a.m. So don't think close a business, it's 10 a.m. Monday the 25th of March. Um, the, it's that, um, programs industry agnostic you can be in any industry um, but uh, you need to be as I mentioned before have a product or a service or a process that's that's almost ready to commercialize um, need further on on that good question in regards to um, when we as like when the BDO team sits down helps a potential client go through the grant application process um, I guess one of the big things is, and we'll probably discuss this in a sec when it comes to the R&D stuff, is costs or how, how we as a team support them and what the initial upfront cost would be and what a success fee might look like. What does How does BDO typically um, price themselves to assist when it comes to things like grant applications? Grants are a tricky one, as I said, because not you, you don't know that you're definitely going to get the funding. So with R&D, we can sit down an initial discussion and determine whether you're, you've got an eligible R&D project and approximately how much benefit you're going to get yep. and that makes it easier for us to then give you a quote to assist in that process. With a grant, they're competitive merit-based. We don't necessarily know who you're up against and how competitive. Um, we get an idea, having done this for a number of years, you get an idea of who's going to be competitive. Um, 
But um, because of that, um, and because there's no guarantee that you're going to get any funding, we tend to work in, in a two-stage way in that we have a smaller upfront fee um, to assist you to prepare the grant application. And again, that fee can vary as to whether um, we're reviewing um, your work, uh, your grant application, or we're preparing that for you. Um, and then we tend to try and have a success component, um, which allows us to recover the costs we've incurred. So we don't do tend to do straight success fees. So we try not to take a big chunk of your grant funding, mm -hmm. but we do try to recover our costs if you are successful on that grant. Yep, got you. Um, and with when it comes to um, like the R and D tax incentives and, and having your team assist, like obviously for most early stage high growth companies, cost is a factor. Uh, talk us through roughly how the process you would go with um, with an early stage high growth uh, company, just to give them a ballpark figure in regards to uh, what they should expect if they were to to engage someone like your team to to help. Yeah, I think um, it's not cheap um, and um, it's important. We make sure that you are compliance ready. So there is um, definitely the cost that needs to be incurred on that. Um, an average, and it's really average because it really depends on the complexity of your business, how many projects you've got. But on average, it's probably looking at about $10,000 per project. Mm -hmm. If you're a really simple business, it'll be less than that. If you're a more complex business, it's going to be more than that. Um, but that's probably um, about a ballpark figure and pretty consistent across the market. Um, if, if somebody um, offers you way cheaper than that, you've got to be asking, what, what are you going to get? And if somebody is way more expensive than that, you've got to be asking, you know, are you getting value? Yep. Um, so from an R, that's basically how we price from an R&D. We can do, particularly um, where it's a little bit of a um, black box and we don't know exactly how much is going to be there, we may go into an arrangement where a time cost capped at 25% of your after-tax benefit. So that's the 25% of the 16%. Um, so on a 100 grand claim in that case, then our fees would be capped at 4,800. Gotcha. Um, and I guess the, the big thing, um, for me or the, the confidence you've done for, for me when we've been helping uh, early stage high growth companies in our startup program is that you've been very explicit up front with like you know, what the initial costing will probably look like and so that when it comes to being able to, to budget for that or be able to, to get feedback your team has been really great at being able to to give the startups peace of mind of knowing what's coming so it's not just a, a big bill in the mail at the end of the, the time that they weren't expecting which I think has been super super helpful um, now in regards to some last questions um, and we do have a couple here and and bless you, uh, Nikki. Uh, some of them are, are going to be fun for you. Um, so the first one I have for you is if you have a separate IT development company invoicing you for research and development, would that make timesheets and overheads less of a problem? They will, but what um, the ATO are now saying is where you um, outsource the R&D, they will expect to see in, in the contracts or in the invoices details of the R&D that was being undertaken. Um, so it, they, the difficulty there is that your contractor may not know that, that what they're doing feeds into an R&D project. So what we'll, all we say there is just make them um, a little bit more explicitly, rather than just an invoice that says services rendered, it actually sets out to working on these particular activities. Yeah, got you. Second question. This one will be a nice, fun, curly one for you. In a profitable business for the benefit of the 43% um, with the 16% net, does it not reduce the franking credit so that there is no benefit to shareholders if not 100% of the dividends are paid out? Yeah, that's correct. So it does does reduce your ability to pay frank dividends, but it's a timing benefit. So most companies don't pay out the full profits from the company year to year, and therefore um, they still get the timing benefit of claiming the R&D. Gotcha. Um, I guess in wrapping up, um, one of the things that I've been really um, – Really impressed with the the grants and the R and D tax incentive team is just how helpful you've been, in, in particular in regards to giving some feedback both to people who have wanted to do an application themselves and just be able to to use you, I guess, as a uh, your team as a check to make sure there's any red flags, all the way through to people who are time uh, poor and can't get any of these applications and things done themselves and being able to provide a solution to them. Um, if people are interested in in chatting to you or having access to um, the team, what's the best way to, to to touch base with the R&D tax team here at BDO? Yeah, probably um, just to touch base with myself and then I can put you through. Our team are really passionate about what we do. Um, as I said, most 
come from science or engineering backgrounds and they really actually are interested in what you're doing. That's why I think we're um, so keen to help where we can. Um, so um, my email and detail and phone number will be sent to you as part of the um, the webinar um, feedback that we'll, we'll send out. So you should have that. But if any um, in doubt, it's nicola.persa at bdo.com.au. Uh, 32375648. <laughs> Excellent. We, we, when in the recording, you can all like pause like six times to try and get those numbers. It'll be brilliant. But uh, Team Awesome, you've been wonderful. It's been a pleasure to sit down and quickly talk to the ever wonderful Nicola Persa when it comes to all things R&D, tax incentives, and, and certainly the grants. Um, if you have any questions, particularly if you're an early stage high growth company founder and you're looking for um, a little bit of assistance and help when it comes to either trying to get your company ready for investment for scaling or for, for a potential sale or in particular if anything that we spoke about today when it comes to the uh, R&D tax incentives or, or the grant applications and so forth is something you'd like to explore more uh, please feel free to, to reach out um, to either myself or to, to Nikki and here in the team here at BDO would love to help um, but for the moment we've gone a couple of minutes over it's been a pleasure to spend uh, the last uh, 50 minutes with you all I hope you all have a fantastic um, start to the year and if you are putting in an application either for R&D tax uh, instead of credits or the uh, any of the grants we'd love to, to chat and see if we can be helpful but for the moment have a wonderful rest of your day and we look forward to speaking to you all soon thank you very much mark